Boston. Noti à la Bolsa in New York. Venue à la Bourse de New York. Welcome to the New York Stock Exchange. Don't you think we ought to invest, honey? No! What's the headline here? The stock market's rigged. The United States stock market, the most iconic market in, um, in global capitalism, is rigged. Hi, I'm Dave Lauer. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there today, but uh, happy to participate via video and Skype. Hi, I'm Pete Herzog, and I'm even happier to be here than Dave is. My background is computer science and finance. Uh, I went to school for both, got a master's in finance. I'm the co-founder and managing director of ISACOM, a security research institute. We focus on open methodology. One of our biggest projects is the OSTM, the OSSTMM, Open Source Security Testing Methodology Manual, with over 12 million downloads a year. Dave Lauer was a trader and analyst at top HFT firms Alston and Citadel. He was asked to testify as an expert at a Senate committee hearing about high-frequency trading. I left high-frequency trading in 2011 and have subsequently worked on um, big data and predictive analytics in finance, uh, understanding market structure, which is the set of rules and regulations that underpin markets. Um, I worked at IEX for a bit, helping to design their technology systems, um, and I work with lots of pools, venues, um, exchanges, uh, large asset managers, and broker-dealers uh, in a consulting capacity, and I also sit on the board of a new exchange up in Canada called Equitas. I have a long history in security, uh, starting off working for corporations, those three-letter acronyms that I'm sure you know. In 2001, I co-founded ISACOM. I did it because I wanted to make sense of security. I knew something was wrong, it wasn't adding up, and the way people were doing security just didn't make sense. So we started this nonprofit security research institute just to figure that out. My specialty was performance engineering and latency minimization. Uh, to give you a sense, one of my programs at the time in 2010 uh, had an average response time, which was the wire-to-wire -wire latency going from when a piece of data hit the network card on the server to when the order was out the door from that server to the market center of around 40 microseconds with a standard deviation in the tens of microseconds. So uh, performance engineering was everything, especially for latency-sensitive trading strategies. And I remember looking up and just like every trading floor CNBC is on and I saw that the Dow Jones had dropped another 100 points and I said, okay, whatever, and kept, kept working. Uh, Michael Lewis has got a new book out about uh, the stock market. Oh boy, it ain't pretty. Um, he's going to go on 60 Minutes to talk about it. It's called Flash Boys uh, because it's about flash trading and, and how they have a monumental advantage over the regular uh, trader, meeting you and me who go out there in the stock market and make file our trades. We're such suckers. But I just don't understand how they do it. Well, when I received your order, I had it phoned to our firm's order room. They sent it by direct line to our firm's booth down there on the rim of the floor. Then the uh, telephone clerk signaled his floor broker by pushing a button, causing the broker's number to flap on that large board over there. And then the broker went over and picked up your order. And that's it? Well, that's half of it. Uh, you wanted to buy, but obviously someone had to be willing to sell. <laughs> We're going to find a seller in this crowd. Well, you see those structures shaped like horseshoes along there? 
Those are the trading posts. There are 19 of them. About uh, 75 stocks are assigned to each post. And under the exchange rules, that's the only place on the floor that those stocks may be traded. So your broker goes directly to the post where your stock is located. And uh, so do other brokers who want to buy and sell that same stock. So I'm sure many of you have uh, trading accounts. You probably have uh, a retail brokerage account from somebody like uh, Charles Schwab or Fidelity or some type of discount online broker. Um, and the journey of an order when you submit it from the web page of your broker is, is quite interesting. Uh, it's no longer the case that that order, again, goes down to the floor of a stock exchange where a person handles it and fills it, um, and you get a confirmation back maybe in 15 minutes or a couple hours. Then, of course, the transaction is reported to the ticker room, and in a couple of minutes or so, it appears on tickers in thousands of brokerage offices all over the country. Well, it makes me feel kind of important. Now, a lot of these online brokers have two-second guarantees or one-second guarantees. They guarantee that when you send a marketable order, you get that fill back right away. Um, generally, you get some bit of price improvement. You said you want to buy the S&P 500 ETF at $200, and it comes back, and you got a fill where you only bought it at 199 spot 999. You got uh, a hundredth of a penny of price improvement. You see, your order was a market order, which means that the broker had to get the best possible price at the time the order reached the floor. So he first gauges the market according to the previous transaction and the current bids and offers, and then he determines what price he'll bid for your stock. This is where his skill as a broker comes in, because there are other buyers and sellers all trying to get the best possible price for their clients. If at any given time people want to buy more shares in a particular company than are offered for sale, the stock will usually go up. If there are more shares offered for sale, the stock will go down. The journey of an order after you hit that button on the web page is far less simple than it used to be. There are many different interaction points, many different points at which it's transferred from one company to another over these private networks. Uh, and certainly many opportunities for uh, security vulnerabilities and, and potential for exploitation. The point is that prices are arrived at openly and fairly, and the exchange insists that trading be done in a loud, clear voice. When you first submit that order, there are two kinds of orders that you can submit. You can submit a marketable order or a limit order. Um, marketable orders mean that there's somebody out there willing to buy or sell at the price that you're submitting the order at. It means you should get the fill back right away. Now, right away can mean one or two seconds. One or two seconds is an eternity in markets. There was nothing. There was no market for, for moments, for seconds. There was no market. And we're all just sitting there, and you're staring into oblivion. You're like, you have no idea what is about to happen, but something that you could not possibly have thought could happen, just happened. The exchange has to know about it. Okay, you can't just let it go. So eventually, everybody who trades through an exchange like the London Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange will know about these big orders, but there's a time delay. Uh, it is enough time for that retail broker to send the order over to a high-frequency trading firm that acts as what's called a wholesaler or an internalizer. The folks at Radians would ask me, hey, can you ask them what's the value of a millisecond? I have no idea why this guy's so happy. And I'm not saying that high frequency is as profitable as this anymore, but I, I took him out to dinner. He, a few weeks later, he came up to visit his boxes, I guess, and we went out for a dinner, and I asked him, why are you so happy with having your environment trading in 3.9 milliseconds versus 43? And he said, put it this way. He goes, in the first four days of trading at your venue, sorry, in your uh, data center, using the exact same strategy I was previously running in uh, Kansas, I've made more additional money on this strategy than to pay for your services for 18 months. And at the time, we were charging them $30,000 a month. So I was like, you mean to tell me you made more in four days additionally on top of your strategy to pay for $400,000 worth of services? And he's like, absolutely. You know, there's no rush about uh, making an investment. The exchange has been around since 1792. So these internalization systems will get the order, and they get a marketable order, and they pay the broker. They pay the broker for those orders. Those orders are valuable because they're essentially random, 
with no short-term outlook. So these market makers, these wholesalers, have an outlook. They say, I think that the market's about to tick up or tick down uh, over the next 10 milliseconds or over the next five seconds. That's my alpha. That's my insight into what the market is going to do. Uh, this retail investor has no view. They're buying for their retirement. They're buying to hold something for months or years. Uh, they don't care what happens in the next five seconds, nor should they, because they can't compete with these high-speed electronic trading systems, and that's okay. I think the mistake a lot of people make is they look at the wrong time frame. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out the next three months, six months, or even the next year, you know, and they get wound up in what I refer to as the data point du jour, right? Every day, the media blesses us with another economic data point that's either good or bad, the market rallies or, or goes down, and not insignificantly, 100, 200 points on the Dow. Um, and and it, like that matters, right? And it's noise. It's noise in the system, but we're fixated on it, right? We try to zig and zag. So number one, you got to broaden your, your horizon, your investment horizon, and think the next two, three years, which we would consider kind of the intermediate term. That's valuable because of the randomness. Um, it's called uninformed flow, it's called non-professional flow, it's called juicy flow, you know, it depends where you're at, what they call it, but everyone wants it, and they're willing to pay for it. And that's a phenomenon called payment for order flow, which is, generally speaking, only in the United States. Canada, Australia, Europe, the UK have all outlawed it for um, some reasons that are really not worth going into in this setting, but uh, as a matter of policy, the work that we do also argues against this. Um, nonetheless, this is how it works today. The wholesaler buys that order from the retail trader or the retail broker. The order comes into their electronic systems. Uh, so let's say it's KCG getting an order from um, Fidelity. And they say, well, 60% of the time, they're going to internalize that order, uh, take the other side of it, trade against it essentially, and send the fill back to Fidelity. So that sort of a bang, bang thing happens very quick. Um, 40% of the time, they don't do that. They don't want that order. They judge it to be toxic. It doesn't work with the inventory they're holding. So suddenly now it enters what's called a hot swapping exhaust system. That's really what it's called. It's for my project. I thought I'd sort of work it into my cybernetic computer, just for contrast. Wholesaler, this one firm, will have electronic connections set up to all the other wholesalers. And it'll say, do you want this? No. Do you want this? No. Do you want this order? No. Do you want this order? No. Um, all the while, they're letting these firms know that there's an order out there uh, with this kind of interest. That someone wants to buy a certain number of shares of a security at a certain price. Um, each one of these pings into these other systems takes milliseconds or less. Um, so, you know, let's say five other venues have been pinged, nobody wants it, and all that has elapsed is maybe 20 milliseconds. So, you know, the... The internalizer, the wholesaler, still has, you know, if they if there's a one-second guarantee and they got to get it back in a half a second uh, just to make sure, you know, that's 500 milliseconds, they've still got 480 of those 500 milliseconds. So now they're going to go look at the dark pools because of the fee structures at work. So they're going to say, you know, Goldman, is there another, is there an order on the other side of this? No. How about Credit Suisse? How about UBS? They're going to start hitting uh, one of maybe 20 dark pools. Dark pools were originally, if you like, and you could see as the origin of a dark pool was originally the idea that a big participant, imagine a pension fund, for example, a big market participant, they've got a lot of shares they want to sell, okay? And what they don't want to do is let the rest of the market know they've got all these shares to sell. Because in a market, if somebody declares they've got a huge number of something to sell, other people move the price against them, i.e. drop it, and they end up selling for a lot less than they hoped. All right. I'll take 100 shares at $10 a share. So in a market, in a big market, you don't want your competitors to get wind of the fact you've got a lot of shares to either buy or sell. I've still got things left to do. Problem is, the name gives it away. As soon as you have transactions being completed away from an exchange that would normally be part of the exchange's normal activities, that will tend to move liquidity. That's volumes of trades away from the exchange. That can start to affect prices. Uh, the volume of trade going through the exchange, it can make it harder to get reliable prices on exchange and it breaks down trust. Starting in 2007, I started to realize that the, the stock market that, that I thought I knew uh, was actually changing pretty dramatically. And what I mean by that is, so this particular snapshot up here, if you can see, 
If I have stock to buy, uh, advanced micro devices, AMD is the ticker. If someone gives me an order to buy 100,000 shares, I pull up a quote. And as you can see, there's a bid price, $2.90. There's 54,600 shares bid there. And there's an ask price uh, at $2.91. There's 115,000 shares for sale. Um, so in 2006, if I had 100,000 shares of AMD to buy, I'd pull this up. I'd type into my computer, buy 100,000 AMD, 291, enter. I'd come back. You bought 100,000 AMD, 291. In 2007, I would try to buy 100,000, and I would get 80,000. And in 2008, I tried to buy 100,000, I'd get 60,000. In 2009, I tried to buy 100, I'd get 45,000. Um, this was a very frustrating thing. Only at the very end of this pipeline will they say, okay, now I'm going to have to go to an exchange. i got to pay a good amount of money to go execute on an exchange. Um, but I'm going to have to do it because I have to fill this order. And so they're going to go to the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange or BATS um, or Direct Edge. Those are the four major exchanges uh, and try and fill that order. So within the span of just a couple hundred milliseconds, you know, uh, maybe 40 or 50 different destinations can have been pinged and checked to execute this order before it's finally executed and sent back to the retail broker as a fill. And so when you sent that order, you clicked and a second later it said, that order's been filled, um, it could have been a very simple process or it could have been a very complex process. Oh, and you might have noticed that there was no handshake and no contract sign when the brokers reached an agreement. Their word is enough. We're well, showing cash, that's your idea, right? It's just about money. My check! My check! My check! My check! My How do I get in? shaking my head a lot quite frankly the last uh, the last 36 hours and I think first thing I'd say is you know Michael and Brad shame on both of you for falsely oh. accusing literally thousands of people and possibly scaring millions of investors in an effort to promote a business model now Sue it's, it's a very very old tactic to try to build a business on the planks of fear mistrust and accusation this is certainly taking that to a new level and the same holds true even more so for institutional orders when it's time for a mutual fund who comes in and they want to buy, let's say, a million shares. Um, I think T. Rowe Price came out recently and said when they, they went to go buy a million shares uh, of something and because of how that order was sliced up and sent to all these different venues and all these exchanges trying to hide its tracks and obfuscate the interest, it ended up being something like 75 million shares. Uh, were put out into the market just to execute that one million shares. So there is a dramatic amount of complexity in the market now. There's a dramatic amount of fragmentation where you have 11 stock exchanges, uh, 40 to 50 alternative trading systems or dark pools, and uh, 100, possibly more, internalization systems. The first thing that we figured out was that the stock market that we thought we knew was not actually the stock market. The problem was this. I had 100,000 shares to buy. I saw 100,000 shares on my screen of AMD, but that 100,000 shares wasn't actually just at one stock exchange. It was spread out across as many as, at the time, 13 different stock exchanges uh, located in four different buildings. RBC was located in downtown Manhattan. So when I would enter, buy 100,000 shares of, of AMD, that order would get sent to a smart order router and it would get blasted out to the market. And as that order got blasted out to the market, it would actually arrive at different stock exchange buildings at different times, simply because of the speed of light. We'd send the orders out at the same time. They would arrive at different data centers at different times, and the variance in arrival was two milliseconds. Um, but from Ronan's perspective, he actually informed me that he could pick up a message at one data center and race me to the next one in as little as 476 microseconds which is four times faster than it took the same messages that I was sending to arrive at various markets, which means he could pick up a signal at one market and race to the next one. So that kind of covers um, the infrastructure at a more macro level uh, between venues and within an, an exchange matching system. Um, on the hardware engineering side, and software engineering side for high frequency participants, you usually have cutting edge equipment. Um, we would use the latest servers. We when we were trading, um, 10 gigabit ethernet was as fast as it could get. You would use kernel bypass technology. 
uh, cut through switches from Arista, which would uh, have switch latency measured in single digit nanoseconds. Uh, every, every part of the trading pipeline was something that we would focus on in terms of performance engineering. Everything we could control from the moment that a message left the matching system from the exchange and over that cross connect hit our infrastructure, we would look at networking equipment, at server networking hardware, server operating system tuning, software level tuning. Could we push something into an FPGA or hardware? Um, even the exchanges now are disseminating market data using FPGAs to handle the high volume deterministically. People are putting trading strategies into FPGA so that the path mean, the path is that the a market data update can come into a server, hit the NIC over to an FPGA card, which um, is able to quickly run through a model in nanoseconds, determine whether to generate an order, send that order directly through the NIC back to the exchange, and you've never hit an operating system, a general purpose CPU, or had to deal with any of the overhead. And, and now we're talking response times in nanoseconds. So one one thousand, the blink of an eye, whoever it is who measures this crap. And they're developing hardware accelerated chips that will execute trades in 740 nanoseconds. Now a nanosecond is sort of a little difficult for us to imagine because we're humans and we operate up here. But a nanosecond is the length of time it takes for light to travel. And we got on the phone and the guy said, listen, it's taken me 43 milliseconds, so 43 one thousandths of, of a second to execute a trade from Kansas, meaning I hit the button, trade goes to New York, executes at some exchange in New Jersey, and comes back to me and it's 43 milliseconds. And my inner monologue while I was on the phone was more or less like, what the hell is a millisecond? And then I said something to the effect of, oh, that sounds terribly slow. And um, I, I, I met with the guy, and I had him come to New Jersey, and Radiance had a data center in New Jersey, and we, we, we built him a product that we call Proximity. And we just said, why don't you move your computers here? We'll connect you to the markets from New Jersey. And we were able to lower his latency from 43 milliseconds. So to just to recap nine. here, speed, distance, complexity, liquidity, this is how an exchange operates. This is how people make money and lose money, but this is why they do it, to make money. And because of the speed issues, it can't work like internet-based solutions. They need a different kind of security solution because something like a firewall just won't work out. It slows down packets. And it's the same that's with almost any security device that you would traditionally use would not work in a stock exchange. As recently as 10 years ago, 80% of volume on New York Stock Exchange securities happened on the New York Stock Exchange floor. 80% of these orders were being handled by a person on the floor of an exchange just 10 years ago. For 150 years, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange was the center of the financial world the economic engine that helped American business raise capital and create jobs. Today, it's still the public facade of Wall Street and a television backdrop for reporters relaying financial news. But less than 30% of the trading is conducted here now, and the specialists and the noise of the floor is being replaced by the speed and quiet efficiency of computers, and the action is moved elsewhere. It's not our world anymore. It's one of the things we have to realize. It's not our human world anymore. It's the world of the machines. Which means that the stock market is a series of data centers, essentially data centers in New Jersey, um, that all have incredibly high-speed infrastructure, high-volume infrastructure, able to handle bursts of millions of messages per second uh, in a consistent way. Most people don't know it, but the majority of the stock trades in the United States are no longer being made by human beings. They're being made by robot computers capable of buying and selling thousands of different securities in the time it takes you to blink an eye. And these algorithms reside inside these machines. They reside inside servers that are connected together and they're connected together and they're located as close as possible to the exchanges so that they can get access to that information before anyone else. This is a world where the speed of light is something you have to factor into the equations you make. This is a world where the international exchanges are connected by undersea cables such as this one, where $300 million is being spent to shave five milliseconds of time so the algorithms can be a little more competitive with each other. 
When you look at what an exchange looks like, it's essentially an electronic matching engine uh, with things called cross connects. And the cross connects are what allow co-located servers to connect into the exchange matching system. The matching engine uh, is one set of servers. The order entry gateway is another set of servers. And that's where clients, either high frequency trading firms or broker dealers connect. They uh, house their servers in the same data center as the exchanges. That's called co-location. And they use the cross connects to connect into the order entry gateways where they submit orders, generally using electronic binary formats, uh, predominantly now uh, over UDP, although for a long time it was TCP. Uh, for performance reasons, most venues have started to offer UDP order entry systems with binary proprietary protocols. These supercomputers, which actually decide which stocks to buy and sell, are operating on highly secret instructions programmed into them by math wizards who may or may not know anything about the value of the companies that are being traded. All exchanges are connected to each other, and many participants have servers co-located in every data center in which there's an exchange. Uh, you have the BATS and Direct Edge exchanges, which uh, I believe are in Secaucus, New Jersey. You have NASDAQ, which is in Carteret, New Jersey. And then you have New York Stock Exchange, which is in Mawa, New Jersey. All of these systems, um, all these exchange matching systems have connections running between the three data centers. Uh, you have high frequency trading firms who have used leased lines for private uh, fiber connections between data centers, trying to find the fastest path, the straight line path between data centers. You also have wireless connectivity now being used. Microwaves and lasers are particularly popular. Microwaves and lasers both uh, the same speed in terms of latency for, dis latency for distance, uh, lasers being less prone to disturbance by weather and higher amounts of bandwidth. And we see the growth of these algorithms as they get quicker and quicker and take more and more of this share of the financial markets. 65% of all trades and equities in the US are now done by algorithm. What were the algorithms that you were building at uh, Citadel and what was their function? I can't get into that. <laughs> I'm terrified of Citadel lawyers. So. There are now more than 80 alternative trading systems around the country, plus two brand new electronic stock exchanges, which most of you have probably never heard of. Um, there was as many as 13 exchanges. There's 11 exchanges currently. All of them are co-located. Names like Chicago, Boston, Philly, all are co-located in four buildings in New Jersey. There's 41 uh, dark pools. All but two are in those same four buildings in New Jersey. So it's a very concentrated amount of uh, venues in four different locations in the same state. In my investigation, I have not seen a single case where the exchange has been directly hacked, as we know hacking to be. Modern electronic trading networks are very different. First of all, uh, they are predominantly UDP-based for performance reasons. They are predominantly peer-to-peer -peer in terms of internal messaging within firms. Connections between firms are trusted. There is an authentication that happens to establish the connection. Um, and so once that authentication takes place, there's very little in, the ter in terms of security. You don't have encryption. That would slow things down. When we're talking about latency in nanoseconds, you can't afford the amount of time that it takes to encrypt and decrypt data. You don't even generally use compression technologies for protocols. Uh, there's one protocol called FAST, which is uh, fix adapted for streaming technology. Fix is a string or ASCII protocol. And FAST is a way of compacting, not even compressing, compacting that text-based protocol. And that compaction and, and decompaction can be done very quickly. So that has become a standard in several different places, especially the futures market. But you do not have encryption. You do not generally have compression. You don't have, um, there's repudiation. It's non-repudiated. There's no authentication once you're inside this network. Once you've, you've been granted access, you know, generally it's getting that access from the outside that's a very difficult process. There are regulatory hurdles to overcome. There's trust and capital requirements at work. Uh, you have to become 
generally speaking, a broker-dealer, which means you register with the SEC, you register with FINRA. These are two regulatory bodies to do deep, generally, inspections on the firms, make sure that this is the kind of firm that should be allowed to connect into the national market system. And then they often do so through another broker who is the executing broker, governs access and risk. It, there, there are rules, something called 15C35, the market access rule, which says that if you're being given access to, direct access to an exchange system or the national market system, uh, you have to have the appropriate risk controls in place. The SEC became very serious about ensuring that proper risk controls were being put in place and proper software development life cycles were being adhered to with testing before things were pushed into production. Um, although it's questionable um, whether firms are really being held to that, and probably one of the larger vulnerabilities in the system is a repeat of something like that uh, that could potentially lead to another flash crash or something equivalent. But you know, all of these these systems that connect into the national market system that connect to an exchange, um, once they're in, yes, there are certain levels of risk controls. You put controls at the software level. You try and put risk controls at the firm level. The broker should be monitoring the the flow going in, and the exchange should be monitoring it. And then even outside of that, you have something called centralized clearing. It's a depository that all security transactions go to. And even that depository is trying to implement real-time risk controls um, to monitor systems and try and cut them off. These things are called kill switches, um, but kill switches are not sophisticated. They're, they're not adaptive. They don't understand conditions in the market. They are simply threshold-based. They say if you do a certain number of orders per second, you get cut off. If you reach a certain level of risk, you get cut off. Um, it's not to say that there aren't ways around that. Um, that could particularly be vulner vulnerabilities in the current system. So let's take a look at why and how there's vulnerabilities in the stock exchange, in that kind of system. I think you need to understand that first you have to know how a normal internet connected network looks like. And of course, this is what we know uh, in its very basic form and security for that. You have your screening router, firewall, IDS, SIM, antivirus, you do load balancing. This is what most people are used to seeing in terms of security. When we talk about security, we're basically talking about you have an asset and you have a threat, and you're basically just blocking interactions or limiting them with some sort of controls. There's actually only two ways to steal something. You either take it or you have somebody give it to you. And this leads to four types of interactions you can have. Uh, we call them inquest, interaction, induction, intervention. So your inquest is any kind of emanations that come off of it, and this is what you're searching for. Your induction, you're looking at the environment. And in intervention, you manipulate what's in the environment to affect the target. And of course, then you have access, which is your interaction. That's when you deliberately or purposely uh, interact with the target directly. If you want to block these interactions, you use operational controls. Now, there's only 10 of them, and you can see here that the 10 controls uh, actually match up then to protect any kind of access or trust uh, or visibility in that case. And you're basically trying to prevent an interaction or prevent one that isn't safe, I should say. And what you see here as a, as a stock exchange is, is basically multiple data centers where information moves. It's not more complex than the internet in many ways. However, based on the protocols and how they work, you can see they're streamlined for efficiency and speed. So the typical exchange is all about moving information. So it's all very data centric in how the data moves through the system. And in this case, speed and high availability leaves no room for security devices or traditional security devices as we know them. A, a race in which the number one and number two players share the spoils. It's your first, you get the order or you get the trade that you want and the rest um, suffer because of it. In institutional traders like Joe Saluzzi of Themis Trading LLC have come to believe that the game is rigged. How can you make money day after day? There was even one firm that said they made money four years in a row every single day. Well, you have to be getting information that other people don't have. Otherwise, statistically, that's an impossibility. Actually, high-frequency traders are getting the same market information that Joe Saluzzi gets. They're just getting it a little bit sooner. 
controversy last year in your S1. Only one trading day of losses in six years. Boy, did that get a lot of attention. How, how did that happen? Can you briefly describe how you only had one trading day of losses? Yep, sure. It, it obviously generated a lot of interest. And really, Bob, it comes down to the law of large numbers. If you do anything and you win more than you lose and you do it a lot during the course of the day, you're going to be profitable. And that's really Virtu. We trade over five million times a day and we win more than we most people, when they lose, they whine and quit. But you got to be there for the turns. Everybody's got good luck, everybody's got bad luck. Don't run when you lose. Don't whine when it hurts. It's like the first grade, Jerry. Nobody likes a crybaby. In New York today, Martha Stewart was indicted on criminal charges relating to an insider trading scandal that began more than a year ago. Well, if she's convicted of all these charges, she faces up to 30 years in prison and $2 million in fine. That fellow that called you, was he in a big hurry? And did he promise you a profit? And was he pushing one stock? I thought so. No, we've already checked into it. The stock is a phony and so is he. Martha Stewart's close friend, Sam Waxel, was CEO of Imclone, a biotech company that produced anti-cancer drugs. When Waxel learned that the Food and Drug Administration was about to reject Imclone's cancer drug, Herbitux, he called his stockbroker, Peter Bakanovic. Bakanovic was on vacation, so Waxel spoke instead to his assistant, Doug Faniel, and instructed him to sell Waxel's Imclone stock. Faniel contacted Bakanovic and explained the situation. Bakanovic, who was also Martha Stewart's broker, told Faniel to call Stewart and tell her that Imclone's share price was likely to drop because Waxel was cashing out. Faniel did so, and Stewart sold all her Imclone shares one day before the announcement of the FDA's rejection. As expected, when the news became public, Imclone shares declined sharply. Had Stewart not sold, she would have lost almost $46,000. These losses were now distributed among the people who bought the shares that Stewart sold to a market ignorant of the FDA's upcoming decision. The crime that most people associate with the stock exchange is insider trading, that and possibly corruption. But insider trading is perfectly well inside the infosec sphere. The problem with insider trading is that it's notoriously hard to catch because you have to prove intent. Using social engineering malware, you could easily infiltrate companies and get financial information that would benefit you for buying and selling. That could absolutely lead to a type of successful insider trading, if so be it. In predatory trading, you're actually attacking the means the way that somebody is buying and selling not so much what they're doing not that you're trying to make the best out of the market but that you're trying to use the way somebody approaches the market as a weakness against them to make more money so an old type of predatory trading is called front running where you take information from a large order and use that information to profit off of. It's called front running because basically you're racing in front of your competitors. Another practice is quote stuffing. And here you can send large amounts of orders into the system, kind of like a denial of service attack. Oftentimes quote stuffing is used to cause chaos and confusion to hide front running, for example. Much like a denial of service attack may be used to hide or obscure a hack. One of the more interesting attacks for me is the watering hole attack, both on the internet and in the stock exchange. So over the internet, what you have is malicious code put out there in a way that tempting to people to go to. It could be on a website that people visit. It could be a, an image. It could be, you know, that you see across social networks. A stock exchange, the watering hole attack, you are these companies that are offering a minimum number of stocks of each listed company on the exchange to buy and sell. And they use that in order to front run. Another technique is known as layering or order book fade. And here you're just putting a lot of sell orders at different price points. And you're basically trying to drive the price down. And once you do, then you buy and you cancel all the sell orders that you can. Another type of predatory trading we call momentum ignition. So that's where an attacker instigates the people in the market to trade aggressively in order to spike the price. And the moment it spikes, they trade out. And this is really something that happens in minutes, not hours. You may have heard of banging the clothes. It's been in the news about the, the recent Forex scandal. So basically in this, what they try to do is uh, they have a 60 second uh, closing window with benchmark rates. And what they do is they try to collectively 
by meeting in chat rooms and discussing how they're going to do this throughout different banks, different brokerages, and they want to drive down a price within that 60 second window. Now, don't think that these brokers were doing it to help their clients. Actually, what they were doing is they were doing this in order to make more money for themselves, in which case then at the standard price, they would make the exchange again for their clients. So this is money that went in their own pocket. Hence why it was a scandal. And of course, the, the one that's always in the news nowadays is the whole social engineering of the masses. This has been around forever. Uh, pump and dump type stock taking over or hacking into a, into a news feed or a Twitter feed in order to manipulate info about a specific company affecting how many people buy or sell in that company. And this, this kind of system is almost perfect. Almost perfect all the time or almost all the time because sometimes this happens. And for those of you that don't read financial um, charts for a living, this might be a little more familiar. This is the flash crash of 245. And this is the time when the algorithms between them kind of got together and made a decision that without anything really happening in the world, that we're going to take a trillion dollars of capitalization out of the global financial markets, that we're going to trade Accenture stock for one cent a share, and that Sotheby's was going to be worth about $100,000 for every share that it had out there. And then about 15 minutes later, they decided to go back to normal. Navinder Sarau, 36, was arrested by British police on a U.S. extradition warrant on April 21st after being charged with wire fraud, commodities fraud, and market manipulation by the U.S. Sarau, who has said he did nothing wrong and was just good at his job. Unethical. It's illegal. Something for the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the flash crash was one of those really defining moments for me um, in my electronic trading career and something that had a deep influence on me. Um, it surprised me. I, I, nobody had really thought anything like that was possible up until then. Dow drops another 100 points. Uh, something was obviously happening. That was 300 points. In about three minutes, I turn to my boss. I say, you should look at this. Something's going on. He looks up and he's like, Oh, looks back at his computer, pulls up, we, we start pulling up uh, the programs that are monitoring our trading software, and we see things are really going haywire, volatility is increasing, pricing information wasn't looking quite right, so we just start shutting everything down. Where, where are we? Market. We're going to get it's a up. fast Listen, market. It's a very fast market. That's very well, clear. I, mean, like, I want to know where do we can't... start hitting curve? I mean, you're now dropping uh, right. three or four hundred points here in the past few minutes. Well, I mean, like when I came down, it was not an interesting level. Suddenly, mm -hmm. it's down three hundred more from when I sat down. Yes. You're getting a little more interesting. Well, well, that would have been well, fall of you know, 2008. Obviously. Aaron, if I can, if I can just say something here, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, we've also just uh, looked on the website of the New York Stock Exchange. Circuit breakers don't kick in after 2.30. Just to right. FYI, throw that out there. That is a fair point. Scott, you're there. What, what, is, what is the talk? What happens from here? And what are people saying? Now you're down 800. Yeah, I just went through the December. Yeah, Aaron, and they're saying, when I ask them what the heck is going on down oh, here, no, uh, I don't know. There is fear. This is capitulation, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is classic capitulation. There is fear in this market. You can take a look at what has happened with the VIX absolutely exploding today. You have seen a flight to safety within gold, a flight to quality no, within treasury, a flight, a flight out of equities from almost every single major sector. We have seen it accelerate throughout the day, and that's why right now we're sitting down 875 points, Aaron. The CEO of the company comes running out and he starts screaming. He's like, shut it off, shut it all off. And so we all just start running around. We ran over and we just start control seeing everything we can find. Just stop the software, stop the software, turn it all off. Um, no one knew what was happening. No one understood what was going on in the markets. Nobody could trust the pricing information that was coming into the software at the time. And so um, the reaction was just protect, our, protect ourselves, protect the firm, shut all the software off. And again, you can kind of imagine that all across the world, other electronic trading floors were having the same reaction because um, as we were all set, once we finished shutting down all the software, you had the stock guys, the futures guys, some firm executives that come out. We're all huddled around one monitor, and on the monitor, we're looking at the order book for this e-mini contract. And normally, this is an order book where people are expressing interest in buying. They say, you know, I'll buy 
X number of contracts at this price, Y number of contracts at this price, Z, etc. A very thick liquid book, like I said, one of the most liquid books in the world. And then on the other side, you have offers to sell. So these are the bids, these are the offers. And again, here you have the same thing. I will sell this many at this price, this many at this price, etc. So this is what an order book looks like. It's you know a set of offers to buy, a set of offers to sell. And this is the most liquid instrument in the world. Well, as we're sitting there watching the screen, it's going all over the place. It's up and down, up and down. And, and as we're sitting there, we see it. it suddenly there's spaces. There were price levels in which there were no orders. And then it goes like this. And it starts to distance. And this, you know, pricing levels disappear. And then suddenly, whew, gone. There were no orders in the book. The, mar the market disappeared. We've now broken uh, Dow 10,000. You can go down nearly 900. Start, I mean, you know, it was 400 you... points ago. I, I was 500 points ago when I sat down. It wasn't of interest. Kind you of know, of interest here. Kind of a, little... uh, a few seconds later, it opened again, the futures market, that is, and orders came back into the market. It recovered and it bounced. And uh, 10 minutes later, it was, at least in the futures market, as if nothing had ever happened. And it took regulators months and months to finally come up with a theory that was very limited and linear and, and that did not show an understanding of complex systems and engineering and uh, feedback loops and, and the complex interplay of trading algorithms and herd mentality. Uh, it became obvious to many of us that regulators had a limited understanding of modern markets and couldn't really uh, wrap their heads around what had gone on that day and how things needed to change from a regulatory perspective in terms of this new uh, modern complex electronic market. Would you suggest a good broker I could see in Birmingham? The exchange doesn't recommend a specific firm, but there are thousands of New York Stock Exchange member firm offices across the country, and you can find a listing of the ones in your area in your classified phone book. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.